From HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 254, recorded live Thursday, February 3rd, 2011. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik RAD Controls, the most comprehensive suite of components for Windows Forms and ASP.NET Web Applications. Online at www.telerik.com. In this episode, Scott talks with Damian Edwards about new features in ASP.NET Web Forms. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman, and this is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Web Forms, the reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. That is the title of today's show, and we've got Damian Edwards. How's it going, Damian? Uh, very well, thank you, Scott. You know, we actually had uh, had your buddy uh, uh, Tatham on a couple of months ago talking about web forms and stuff. You guys worked together on uh, the web forms MVP project before you went to work for Microsoft. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. So you guys are smart guys. I mean, you're advanced, advanced alpha, alpha geeks. I think of you guys that way. I mean, if I may be so bold, um, uh, you know, I might describe us that way. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, you like your things a certain way, and you're very opinionated in, in the way that you program. And, uh, sure. you know, th- I think there's some people who might have a misunderstanding about web forms and web forms, uh, why you'd even bother with web forms. Uh, there's so many, there's so much hype right now around MVC, but if you look at the stats, I think that, you know, probably big, big numbers, 80% of people are still using, 90% are still using, still using web forms, even though MVC is the kind of the new sexy thing to talk about. Why do you think that the alpha geeks are going in one direction, and why is web forms getting a bad a bad rap? Uh, that's a that's a difficult question. Um, like I think the alpha geeks tend to pick on many different things about web forms. I mean, web forms is very good at doing uh, particular types of things and, and doing those you know, very well. And if it suits your purposes, then it, there's really nothing wrong with using that. And coming back to why people sometimes uh, may pick on web forms for various reasons. It, we have to remember that web forms really was designed to be an abstraction over the top of um, the core raw protocols of building or involved when you're building web applications. So it really abstracts away the idea of HTTP, um, of doing gets and posts, and, and, and even to a large extent uh, to dealing with the, the web browser. I mean, we, we really don't see an awful lot of HTML. Uh, we don't see a lot of JavaScript that, that the developer has to write unless they really want to get under the covers. Um, right. And I think a lot of people, uh, when they when they see that abstractions start to leak, um, that they they use that as a reason for for putting the whole uh, sort of platform down, um, whether that's right or wrong, I guess will depend on your circumstances. But I think those are the sort of things that people have in the past picked on web forms for. Well, so are you saying that that there's a there are, there are or there are not problems with web forms, or are you saying that there are problems with alpha geeks? And those personality quirks cause them to pick on web forms. I'm trying to understand like which direction you're coming at this from. Um, I, I think there are problems with any platform or framework, depending on what direction you're coming from. And so, certainly for doing certain types of things, web forms can get in your way um, uh-huh. if you want to be able to have certain types of control um, or get certain advantages out of using sort of the pre-canned elements. You'll find that there are restrictions and caveats that come along with doing that. Um, now, with the resurgence of, I guess, in the last few years of, of web programming, um, uh, treating web programming as actual web programming and not uh, dealing with some abstraction over the top, um, and the resurgence in things like uh, all of the, the, the rise of things like mobile devices where having you know, real control over um, markup and what's going in, uh, across the wire from your browser to the server, um, mm. people were running into these uh, running into these uh, limitations, perhaps, of web forms when trying to build applications using uh, sort of the top-level paradigms that web forms brings, like server controls and pages, and uh, were ripe for looking for a, an alternative, and uh, MVC sort of gave that alternative, and it, it really does uh, shine in those areas where perhaps web forms uh, isn't the best-suited candidate. Do you think that when they made web forms that it was 
targeted at i mean people always say like it was targeted at the visual basic programmer at the drag and drop button mm -hmm. programmer mm -hmm. is is it fair to make judgments about a programmer's kind of inherent ability or current skill level when thinking about it in the context of a framework like web forms is good for beginner programmers and such and such is good for uh, advanced programmers or is is it does that have nothing to do with it um I think that's more about what the particular and what the on ramp of that particular platform looks like. I mean, how high is the concept count for someone coming into this platform for the first time? And is there an easy way for them to to ease into um, I I into building for that platform without having to learn a whole bunch of different things before they can even and output a very simple sort of uh, a UI from that from that platform? In terms of web forms, I mean, it's very easy to do the hello world example. It's very easy to get some data from a database and display that on the the screen with, you know, in, in its day was a fairly uh, rich experience with a, you know, a a grid that uh, allows sorting and uh, page postbacks for for paging and those type of things. Um, mm -hmm. Standard sort of business application UI for sure, but. Um, if you were to try and build that from scratch with raw HTML, JavaScript, and some type of server-side programming, um, it would take you a lot longer than dragging a couple of controls on uh, not and configuring some properties and hitting F5 in Visual Studio. So uh, I, I, I'm not sure whether it's it's certainly valid to judge the the willing the suitable whether a platform is suitable or not for for various types of programmers based on you know, their competencies or not. But I, I think there's certainly an element of truth to the to the assertion that uh, web forms was built to really help the VB programmer in quotes, um, yeah, the, not VB know, language, the but the, the kind of proto, yeah, not the VB language, but the yeah. prototypical Visual Basic programmer of the early That's and right. mid nineties who it, th those was not a programmer. Those used to a design surface and event driven programming and those type of things. Right, but the thing that I'm trying to get my head around is that is it somehow? Let's uh, two examples. Somebody takes a data control and drags it from Visual Studio onto the design surface, hooks up a database, and they have a grid. Another person does something from the command line, generates the exact same result, and creates some code that does a for loop that makes a grid, except they did it using a scaffolding system. The output right. is identical, you know, effectively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of them is an advanced is considered an advanced programmer doing really cool stuff with a new framework, and the other one is just dragging and dropping. Is it a matter of programmer bigotry where easy but not too easy? Like if dragon, how is drag and dropping somehow less noble than um, uh, typing rake from the command line? Oh, I don't think it is. Um, again, I'm I'm a big exponent of using the right tool for the right job and. You know, and that includes not just what you're trying to output, but the you know the, the experiences and the and the efforts involved by the people actually building the things. And if if those tools match all those outcomes for the thing that you're trying to achieve, then I don't think it's in anyone's place to tell you that you're using the wrong thing or that what you're doing is in, is somehow inferior to what other people are doing. Um, I I think we as programmers tend to be. I mean, as you you said before, yes, uh, Tatham and I are fairly opinionated. It can be now. If you look at our framework, we've we've made some opinionated decisions about what's there and what's not. But that's not to say that I think it's a developer's job to to judge other developers on these things. At the end of the day, um, we're all just trying to to do our jobs and to to write good code, or you know, mm -hmm. even if we're not trying to write good code, write code that works. Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to sit here and tell people that doing this thing is completely wrong. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, unless unless I can, you know, I, I will have a heated argument about it. But I, I'm not about to tell them that they're completely wrong and they should be doing it this way without really giving consideration to um, what it is that they're trying to achieve. Yeah, yeah. It's funny that people uh, people are still teasing me about making the uh, the website for the other podcast that I do with Rob Connery, This Developer's Life. We made that website in Web Matrix. And, yeah, you know, there's been some gentle ribbing about having done that in Web Matrix because people still think that it was a uh, kind of a toy, and we actually had Rob mm -hmm. on the show and talked about uh, you know, the fun that we had in making that. I wonder if I had built it in web forms, if I would have been uh, teased from a different group. I'm sure you would have. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. Um, I, think, I, I think no matter what technology you choose, you would 
likely get teased. I mean, maybe, maybe MVC is the cool kids you know, smoking behind the bike sheds at the moment. No one's going to pick on them, but uh, right. Yeah, but but everything else, I think, is fair game. Well, it's funny. I always talk about uh, the whole car versus motorcycle analogy. The idea that MVC is a motorcycle that gives you lots of control and it lets you feel the uh, you know feel the road beneath you. And of course, you could fly off the motorcycle and really hurt yourself. But yeah. ultimately, if you if you really want that kind of magic of driving, you you know use MVC, use a motorcycle. And Webforms sure. is the kind of the minivan or the car. It's got more cargo space and it lets you take the kids to the store. It just doesn't look very good. Like myself, now that I've got kids, I drive a. I like to call it a crossover vehicle. That's that's mm-hmm. man speak for a swollen minivan. And uh, but you know, I tell myself that it's okay. But you know, there's really nothing nothing necessarily wrong with that because most people drive cars. Most people use web forms, and um, I know that in .NET four there was a lot of stuff that was added to web forms to make it better. You know, view state got. 30 or 40% smaller. Um, you, you have the ability to uh, have CSS, um, like basically change the rendering of any control using advanced templating. So mm-hmm. even really old funky controls that people have forgotten about, like the ASP wizard control and the you know, stuff like that, you could make it output, you know, divs and mm-hmm. ULs and LIs and stuff like that. That's right. What's, uh, what's coming next though? Everyone's saying that all the all the hype is around MVC, but what what do we know about MV, uh, about the next version of Web Forms? And then also, what what can you do with Web Forms today? You know, so it's interesting you bring it up that people have this perception that um, perhaps Web Forms isn't being invested in. I mean, you just you just pointed out that with our latest release, uh, which is coming up to twelve months now, so it's not even I think ten months since you released that. Um, we did, there was a significant investment in, in web forms in .NET 4. You mentioned a couple of things there. We also did work about controlling client IDs. Um, and then there was a lot of work that went in sort of at the base ASP.NET level that uh, web forms got uh, the advantage of as well. Um, now, for the next version, we're really sort of continuing on this idea of, well, you know, ASP.NET is a foundation framework. And then on top of ASP.NET sit uh, other smaller frameworks that plug into that depending mm-hmm. on how you want to go about building your applications. Um, and from time to time, there will be things that get built in one of those smaller frameworks that uh, are shipped with that framework. And then eventually, it's sort of realized, well, you know, this would be this is a really good concept. And it, do- it doesn't just fit inside this framework. Perhaps we could pull it across to one of the other ones. And so as an example, uh, in the MVC world, we have the idea of uh, model binders, um, and uh, which, which makes a lot of sense in MVC. I mean, MVC is very code focused, mm-hmm. and the idea that um, you you would use some code to access your data to and then generate a model that you give to your view. But then when that that the request from the browser is coming back in, you don't want to have to do all that left hand right hand side code to to take the user input and push that back into your model. So we have the concept of a model binder to do that for you. So we're looking at that concept for web forms and 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 having a look at. What's required today in web forms to, say, use something like Entity Framework code first, where if I want to, if I'm quite happy to write code uh, to do my, my model management in the middle tier off to the database using something like EF code first, how do I go about using that with web forms? Well, today, if you wanted to use a grid view, you'd have a couple of options. You could uh, put a grid view on your page and then uh, drop an object data source onto the page next to it. Uh, configure the grid view to use that object data source. And then you would have to create another class that the object data source is going to look at, um, which is the class that would then have your code in it that does the EF code first work. Um, then if you needed to wire up uh, certain inputs into those methods, like your, your CRUD methods that would exist on that class, you would have to go back into your page markup and declare a bunch of parameters on that object data source to pull all of those values through. So if you look at the markup, I mean, you can do all of this with the designer, but eventually a lot of people will have to jump down into the markup to configure this stuff. And you'll see a lot of markup in your page, just that when at the end of the day, all you want to be able to do is call, you know, my, my database context, you know, dot .customers, dot .get, whatever. Um, and so we're looking at how we can make that a lot easier. So rather than having to have, say, an object data source on the page, you can just have a grid view um, and just point that directly at the methods in your code behind that are going to go off and do whatever it is you do to get data. 
and then also take care of some of that left-hand, right-hand code for you so that when the user clicks the Save button, um, whether it's on a grid view row or a form view uh, edit template, the values associated with that action are, are automatically uh, bound, if you want, model bound, if you like, uh, to the method that you've declared as being, say, the update method in that case. So that's a case where we're looking at bringing some of those things across. Hi, this is Scott coming to you from another place in time. Are you using agile practices to manage your software development? There's lots of tools in the market that manage the steps of a project, but most of them focus on individual roles. Get ready for a solution that caters for the success of the whole team. The guys at Telerik introduced Team Pulse. It's an agile project management tool that will help you gather ideas, estimate, plan, track progress in a common workspace. Finally, companies, regardless of their size, can use a lightweight and convenient tool that makes all the stakeholders work as a united team, even if they're in different countries. By combining intuitive user interface and the power of Serverlight, Team Pulse removes the roadblocks that you typically face in applying Agile in an effective manner. No more lost data, no disparate systems, no lack of critical analytics regarding the health and velocity of your project. See for yourself, get a free copy for five users and one project at Telerik.com slash Team Pulse. And please do thank Telerik for supporting Hansel Minutes on their Facebook fan page, facebook.com slash T-E-L-E-R-I-K, Telerik. We do appreciate it. There wouldn't be a Hansel Minutes if there wasn't Telerik helping us. So, yeah, one of the things when I'm writing a lot of web forms code that I spend, a, I, I am doing is digging around in, in the HTTP request. I mean, that, that's almost half of the kinds of code that I'm writing when I'm messing around. Like you called it left hand, right hand code. Mm. You know, that, that idea that I want to dig into the HTTP request, uh, you know, request.form, request.query string, pull that stuff out and stick it into my object and then take that object and do something with it. That's really tedious code. It's, it can be a huge portion of the uh, of the code behind. It. So with model binding, that just kind of collapses, doesn't it? It does. And I think um, one of the other things that people sort of pick on web forms for is the lack of testability. And it's easy to see that if, if, you, if you open up a, a general, a typical code behind file for an ASP.NET web forms page, you'll, you'll generally see a lot of this type of code, a lot of this UI crud sort of code, and, and it's very hard to test because um, the, the, the ASP.NET base classes for web forms inherently um, aren't mockable. They're, they're not easy to substitute things for, um, to run them outside of the ASP.NET web forms runtime. And so if you wanted to make those things testable, you have to write a layer of your own abstractions um, and then move all that code out into another class, and then you have to have another framework sitting there doing the glue for you. So I think model binders uh, in the context of web forms will kind of help because any code that you can remove from your code behind is A, less code you had to write, and B, less code you have to test. Um, and so less code means less bugs generally. <laughs> hmm. So... Is this the kind of thing that we're going to see as a as a, an add-on or futures? I mean, one of the things that the ASP.NET team has kind of done lately uh, is releasing new add-ons to things like MVC as as MVC futures. Is there a web mm -hmm. forms futures where I can use these kind of things today? Are there other future web forms features that someone could be playing with after this podcast? Um, not, not immediately. I mean, if you go up to the ASP.NET CodePlex site today, there is a web form section, and I believe the only thing in that web forms future section at the moment was the uh, CSS sprites prototype that we shipped uh, last year, mm -hmm. um, which you can certainly go in and have a look at um, to get an idea of some of the things that we were thinking about. In terms of the release mechanism for the things that we're talking about now, at the moment these are all... Uh, being talked about going to the next version of web forms. Now, web forms, we have to remember, is actually part of ASP.NET. It's not like MVC um, in that the web forms assemblies and, and types are actually in the .NET framework base class library itself. So, uh, unfortunately, when we want to make changes to some of these things, it can be difficult for us to do them uh, out of band, which is the term that we use to say when we want to release something that's not part of the main shipping vehicle for .NET or Visual Studio. Now, that doesn't mean we can't all the time. Indeed, if you if you cast your mind back, when we first released the MS Ajax framework um, in version 1, that was done as an out of band on top mm -hmm. of .NET 2 at the time. And then eventually that rolled back into the framework in .NET 3.5 Service Pack 1, I think. 
Um, now, for, for this, um, we're still in early planning, so it's, uh, it could go either way, but at the moment, it's, the thoughts are it would go into the base uh, in the next version of the .NET framework, um, but that's not to say that there won't be other things that we can do for web forms uh, before that uh, next version of the framework comes around. Do you think the sprites thing will be will make it in there? I mean, how many things that make it into a future is released make it into the product, and how do you decide that? Um, I think it's it's really it's not very different to any other software planning um, mechanism or exercise. I mean, I, I've been here for a year now, and I think when I came to Microsoft, I really expected it to be different in terms. I mean, I'd been a software engineer for over ten years, and I'd worked in lots of very big software projects. Um, but all web-based. I'm, I was a web developer, and I sort of came here expecting it to somehow be different. But I can tell you that it's it's not. It's We have a list of features. We have a backlog, if you like, that we sort of keep um, adding to as time goes over. We, we, we collect customer feedback. We talk to customers. We talk amongst ourselves. We prototype internally. And then there comes a point when we need to start locking down features for whatever the next uh, release or the next version of what it is that we're building is. And we go through a process like any other group building software would. We, we, you know, we do a cost analysis of how much uh, it will cost to build a specific feature. What, is, what do we think the benefit to customers is by doing that? How does it fit in with the strategy uh, that we're trying to, uh, to adhere to? And there's really nothing, I think, nothing magic that goes into that process. And in terms of how we're going to make the decision this time, it'll be we have a stack-ranked list of features that we would you know, like to see in web forms. We look at how many resources we have and how much time we have, and then we draw a line underneath where we can't do any more work anymore. All right, so there's a number of things that are coming in web forms then. What, what else do we have that is moving over from MVC? It seems like MVC is revving quickly. It's being developed. We're already on version 3. And because it's out of band, that gives us the ability to do that. With web forms, um, we're moving a little bit more slowly, at least in the short term. Are we bringing other features over from MVC and incorporating them into, into web forms in the next version? Sure. So... Uh, one of the things that Webform, uh, sorry, MVC introduced in version three was uh, the concept of unobtrusive JavaScript, uh, both in the forms of validation and AJAX. And so for the next version of Webforms, we're looking at bringing across at least the validator portion of that. Um, today, there are uh, server-side controls uh, called validators in web forms that you can use to drop on your page that give you uh, pre-canned validation uh, facilities that, that you tie them to the controls on the page, like a text box, and you say, this is required. But if you actually look at what gets emitted into the HTML markup, in order to facilitate the client-side validation, there is a whole lot of JavaScript uh, that gets you know, big arrays of, of, of stuff that gets uh, spewed out into your HTML page um, when you use those things. So we're looking at cleaning that up by using uh, the same mechanism that MVC does today, whereby we rely on jQuery validate to provide the client-side validation sort of base framework. And then we use the HTML5 data dash attributes to uh, inject the metadata required to drive those valid, that validation framework into the page directly onto the controls that you want to validate. Now, when I say HTML5, I'm, I'll, I'll say immediately for people who have who are thinking, well, HTML5 in web forms, you know, what does that mean for backwards compatibility? People have to remember that HTML5 isn't isn't just about adding new stuff to HTML. It was, it's also about rationalization of things that were already supported by lots of browsers, um, just making them part of the standard. And one of those things was something called expando attributes or expando properties. Uh, many, I think many web developers have discovered that they can just add extra properties to uh, their HTML elements. And while the browser may not understand them and they don't, won't get validated by uh, any HTML validator, there, you can happily access those values from, the JavaScript, from JavaScript using the DOM um, once that HTML is serialized, uh, or parsed, I should say. So the data dash um, spec inside HTML5 is just a formalization of that. So it just says, well, any attribute on any element in an HTML5 document that begins with data dash and then something else is totally valid. Just, just that's an attribute that you can put anywhere, and the, the intent for you is to put any values in there that you want to be able to essentially harvest uh, using JavaScript once the page is loaded. So... Um, people don't need to be worried about that not working in, in uh, older browsers. That will work uh, just fine, and we're looking to take advantage of that to sort of clean up some of the JavaScript that we output in terms of uh, validation in the next in the next version. 
in web forms, is there something fundamental about web forms that, that makes people think it makes bad markup or bad JavaScript? Or is it certain controls output different things? You know what I'm saying? Like, is there a control I should avoid? Or how can I make, sh- can I make a web forms application where I can say view source and have it be pretty? Well, you can definitely do that. I mean, uh, and this is you know, some of the talks that Tatham and I have given in the past have been very much about this point. Now, th- there were in the past some controls that we would recommend you completely avoid because they just didn't give you the control that you needed to stop it outputting things like wrapping it in a table tag. Um, now, back when these controls were originally developed, I mean, we think back, this is talking six, seven years ago now, um, that wasn't really frowned upon. Using tables for layout in HTML was sort of... Uh, the flavor of the day, but we know better than doing that now. So um, it, as we mentioned before, in .NET 4, almost all of that was cleaned up. If you use the .NET 4 control rendering mode, you, you will find, you find it very difficult to find a table in your, mark out, in your markup uh, that was generated by ASP.NET unless it's for tabular data, um, say the output of a grid view. So it's actually a lot easier than it was back then, and especially now you can control your view state uh, much more granularly as well and control your client IDs. It's actually much simpler to get cleaner markup. Now, before that, we used some third-party or uh, out-of-band libraries, I guess, to, to help doing this. There was something called the uh, the CSS-friendly control adapters. Um, ASP.NET is built on this foundation of an, ad- of a, of an adaptable control rendering system, so... Even if your button control doesn't output what you want it to output, there is actually the mechanism for you to completely change what that outputs. And there are a couple of ways you can do that. You can subclass the button control and then override its render method, which is kind of the brute force um, approach. Um, Or you can register a control adapter, which um, is a little bit easier, perhaps not an awful lot easier, but essentially maintains the behavior of the control. But uh, at the point where it gets rendered, it'll, it'll sort of shell into your logic to, to, uh, to go ahead and render that control instead of using the default rendering. But you, you really don't have to do that much these days if you're using .NET 4 because of just how much better the markup is. Now, that said, you don't have to use the server controls. I mean, we, we talk about web forms a lot, but um, there's nothing stopping you writing ASP.NET pages, so ASPX pages, and using user controls and master pages and, and that whole sort of front-end mechanism there. But you don't have to use a grid view if you don't want to. You, there's nothing wrong with using a repeater um, or, a, or a list view that is fully templatable and, and, and handwriting your markup um, um, to get the output that you want. I mean, you still get benefits in doing that. The list view, for example, um, has a lot of behavior that is completely separate from the way it is displayed. So the list view supports paging um, and editing and inserting and different templates for all those different modes. Um, And you don't have to worry about controlling what mode it's currently in. It'll just do that using the command mechanism inside ASP.NET Web Forms. But you still get full control over the markup. So there is a middle ground between uh, just giving giving the Web Forms uh, pages and controls full control over what they, uh, or I should say, just delegating to them to say, hey, you render all the markup, I don't really care about that, just give me the behavior. And then the other side where you don't use any controls whatsoever and you're just back to basically writing classic ASP, uh, but with ASPX inline.net pages, there is a middle ground, I think. And uh, you know, the framework WebForms MVP that Tatham and I put together was really designed about hitting that middle ground about, you know, there is some value in using some of the built-in controls in WebForms, but mm-hmm. if you want a little bit more control around testability and around coding and patterns, then this framework can help you do that. Do, do by default, when you upgrade from .dot um, .dot 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 um, breaking changes when they're associated with an upgrade process. So if you mm-hmm. start a new .NET 4 project, you will get the new rendering. But if you upgrade, um, you won't. Now, to change that, you need to change a setting in your web.config file. Um, and you will, in doing so, you will probably find that there will be things that break because most li- generally what happens is people take a dependency at some point um, in the development of an application, of a web forms application, on the markup that's being emitted. They might write some custom JavaScript to do something on the client. 
um, and or they might have some CSS that's targeting uh, the markup that used to be outputted by web forms. And now when mm-hmm. they change the rendering mode, they're going to have to go and change that stuff as well. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So, what what kind of things am I going to run into though? Like, is there a is there a limit to what I can do in web forms? As far as making view source pretty, could could someone create a web forms application that you wouldn't be able to tell it was web forms? I mean, you've got routing also, right? You can make pretty URLs yeah. in web forms. You can. Yeah, I mean, there are there are a couple of limitations. Uh, one is around the uh, the form tag. Now, web forms uh, is is geared around the concept of a server form. Um, and you'll see that in the markup of any web, uh, web forms page, you'll have a form run at equals server tag. You could only have one of those per page, um, and it's, it's not per control. It's not per. It's actually per outputted page. You can only have one of those. Now that does limit what you can do um, in terms of building uh, multi-form pages. Um, and certainly MVC doesn't have this limitation at all because it really has no concept of a server-side form. Um, it just looks at the raw um, request information coming in. Now, that doesn't mean you can't use multiple forms in web forms, but you just you can't have more than one server-side form. So then you know, the follow-on question from that is to go, okay, well, what's the limitations of not having a server-side form? If I have a server-side form and then a client-side form, what can I not put in the client-side form? Now, there are certain uh, ASP.NET server controls that require uh, being inside a server form to work properly. And they'll actually throw an exception if you put them outside of a server form. Um, but I would, I would certainly recommend people, if they're building UIs that have multiple uh, web-based UIs with web forms that have multiple points on the page that require input, um, then you would, certainly it's worth looking at using multiple forms um, if those other portions of UI don't require the complex server controls um, to, to, you know, to sort of render those. And a classic example is if you have a search box at the top of your, uh, in, the, in the header of your website, there's really mm-hmm. no point having that search box inside the server form for ASP.NET Web Forms. And you actually have to work around that sometimes because uh, if you have one form in your HTML, then the, the action of the enter key in the HTML becomes an issue because um, an HTML form t- uh, generally expects to have a single submit button. And when you hit enter inside any field in that form, that's the button that gets submitted. Now, when you look at ASP.NET Web Forms, it was kind of designed to have a single web server form, and then you could put as many buttons on there as you liked. And then it would use the, the it would actually figure out which button you clicked uh, based on a number of different factors that can, it, it can do. But that was all very much based on clicking. If you just want to be able to type in something and hit enter, mm-hmm. you have to set extra properties in web forms to sort of say, hey, this is the button that I want to be, uh, in inverted commas, clicked, or have its click event raised when the user hits enter while I'm in this text box. And it uses JavaScript to do that. So um, it's really not the most elegant way of doing that. If you're just putting a search box at the top of your page, put it in a different form. Put it in a client-side form. It's just a text box and a submit button. Um, and then you don't have to worry about that. When the user is in that text box and they type and they hit enter, it's, mm-hmm. it's automatically going to use that uh, that button, that client-side button there because it's in the same form. Yeah, yeah. I've actually, I've actually done that myself on my own site because... Dust blog, the blogging engine that I run has a single server side form, of course. Uh, yeah. and then I've got some search boxes around the outside and I do some, some just, you know, one or two lines of JavaScript to pull that information out of those form fields and then put, put them through the, uh, the process regularly. Well, it sounds like you guys are thinking a lot about uh, web forms. I'm kind of surprised you're thinking about it pretty, pretty deeply. Uh, are we going to see some web forms cool stuff in the next couple of months or the next year? Um, yeah, I certainly hope so. I mean, as I said, we've mentioned a few things that we're working on for the next version, but I think there are, there are other things that we're working on that we hope to um, get out before then. Um, so certainly some things around our, our move to jQuery as our preferred AJAX model. Mm-hmm. Expect to see some more um, information about that in the coming months, um, and not just information, but hopefully some more concrete things that you can actually use inside web forms, um, mm-hmm. as well as MVC, of course. Um, in, to do with AJAX and, and, and jQuery and things like that. Um, we're obviously keeping a close eye on HTML5 as well. 
Um, we, we get this question a lot about, you know, when is web forms going to be upgraded for HTML5? Um, the, the truth is there's really nothing stopping you using HTML5 today. I mean, HTML5 is a kind of a horrible term because it encompasses so many different things, and I, we really don't know what customers mean a lot of the time when they ask that. Um, but in terms of concrete things, you know, certainly the next version of the templates that we build will use, you know, some HTML5 as much as we can that makes sense. Um, and we'll, you know, we're always looking at what the browsers are, where the current browsers are, are caught up to, and what makes sense to to add as functionality in the base framework to take advantage of whatever new capabilities that the browsers have. Mm-hmm. Um, I think uh, coming up at Mix, we, you'll probably see some talks there about web forms and HTML5 working together, um, and maybe some talks about more about what we're going to we're planning to do in the next version of web forms as well. So um, I think. I think you'll see us uh, talking more about it like we are today. And uh, if you come along to our conferences, you'll, you'll see us continue to talk about it as well. Very cool. Well, thanks a lot for uh, taking the time to educate me on uh, what's going on in web forms. I appreciate it. Not a problem at all. Thanks for having me. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes. We'll see you again next week. Mm-hmm.